round of applause for us. I'm very big on Hakarat Hatov. I think that's one of the big, big things as we talked about last week, right? Gratitude. So what I wanted to start with this evening is just to quickly review what we did last week for those people who couldn't be with us last week because we're building step by step. There's a reason that uh, Stuart uh, titled this <coughs> Stairway to Heaven because we are building our own stairways and we are going to construct our own tefillah reality bit by bit. Oh, I forgot to turn off the ringer on my phone. If anybody else forgot to turn off the ringer on your phone. And I forgot to set up I you to record on Good time. my phone. Okay. Thank you. Is it recording? Yes. All right. All right. So last week, we began with the paradigm of Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Maslow is a 20th century psychologist, and um, he opined that really what all of us want to achieve in this life is self-actualization. Self-actualization is becoming the best person we possibly can. But before we can get to self-actualization, we need to go through steps. The first step is physiological. If you don't have a roof over your head and you don't have food in your stomach, you're not going to worry about being the best person you can be. You're going to worry about getting a roof over your head and getting food in your stomach. After that comes safety and security. Even if you have a roof over your head and food in your stomach, if you feel unsafe, you are not going to be able to focus on anything except assuring your safety and securing your security. After that comes love and belonging. The next need that somebody has before they can be the best person is connecting with others, creating significant relationships in our life. And out of the love and belonging comes esteem, comes self-esteem, comes the way we see ourselves and what we think about ourselves and how we cope with the view, our view, of who we are. And once you've gone through all of those steps, then you can focus on the self-actualization, on being the best person you can. So that's the first step we did last week. The second step we did last week was to look at Simon uh, Sinek's golden circle. Simon Sinek is actually an entrepreneur who has this theory of the golden circle, and he does it in terms of how to market things. But it actually makes sense for life itself. He says that most people market things by telling you what they want to sell you, or telling you how it is going to help you. But they don't tell you why. Why, why do you want this? What do they believe in? If you buy into the belief of whoever's trying to market you something, you're more likely to buy their product than if they're just saying to you what you should buy and how it works. So we're going to take these two paradigms that we started last week and, and apply them to tefillah. So the first question we asked last week was, why? Why tefillah? Most tefillah sessions, classes, shiurim, focus on either the what or the how. What are we supposed to do? We're supposed to daven three times a day. Shachrit, mincha, ma'ariv, we add musaf, we add ilan yom kippur, we add, you know, Rosh Hashanah, Rosh Chodesh, whatever, and how. When do you stand? When do you sit? When do, uh, when can you talk? Hint, never. <laughs> um, I once taught about mitzvah girl, and uh, when I teach Benot Mitzvah, one of the things I make them do is um, I give them a, a list of the appropriate of the Tariyak Mitzvot, and I have them choose a mitzvah that we learn beginning with the Torah and going through all the sources, uh, Mishnah, Mara, Rishonim, Achronim, and they're supposed to take on this mitzvah for life. Because the truth is, for boys, bar mitzvah makes a big, big difference. Right? You start laying tefillin. For some people, you put on a talit. You have an aliyah. You become a bal tefillah. You become a bal kore. This was my bat mitzvah in 1966. My mother woke me up the day I was 12 in one day, and she comes into my room and she says, 
congratulations, from now on you have to fast. <laughs> That's, that was my bar mitzvah. So I have girls really take on a mitzvah for their lives. And one of my bat mitzvah girls took on the mitzvah of Shema. I'm very proud to say she's now in her mid-30s. I'm in touch with her. And she has four children. And she says, not only do I say Shema twice a day, I make sure all of my children, from the moment they're born, hear the Shema and then say the Shema twice a day. But the problem was in her speech, she wrote a line like, so I'm going to ask all the women in my section to please be quiet because I can't focus on the Shema. And her mother calls me up and says, um, could you attenuate that line a little bit? But, all right. So but what we're going to look at is the why of tefillah. And to come to some conclusion, together last week, we looked at um, the, a section in Chovot HaLuvavot, in Shar Cheshbon HaNefesh, where essentially it says that why do we daven? Because our soul longs for Hashem, we submit before Him, we elevate the, its creator, meaning the soul's creator, we praise and we thank Hashem, and finally, we cast all of our soul's needs on Hashem. That's why we pray. It is to achieve a dveikut b'ashem, right? Our souls want to cling to Hashem. And spiritually, this makes a lot of sense. Because when, when the um, Agatha says that every human being has three creators, your mother, your father, and Hashem, what does that mean? Our physical, <coughs> ephemeral existences come from those who also have a physical ephemeral existence, that's our parents. Our neshama, which is eternal, the only source can be from the eternal, with a capital E, that's God. So our soul longs for the creator of our soul, because that's where it comes from, right? If you, if you um, study Luriana Kabbalah, everything contains a spark of God but only the human being is created but Salam Elohim in the image of God. And so we long to cling to God. That's this Dveikut that we're searching for. But we would be fooling ourselves if we thought that we can just jump into Dveikut. The same way as you can't just jump into self-actualization where, you know, I, I don't know where my next meal is coming from. I don't really have a job. But I'm going to self-actualize. It doesn't work that way. Dveikut Bashem doesn't work that way either. So last week, we started talking about this idea of dispositions. Now, what I mean by dispositions are the steps that we need to take to work towards this Dveikut Bashem. And the reason it's called a disposition is, is because that is what we will be disposed towards, right? The same thing is resonating towards what we will be disposed towards to reach this Dveikut Bashem. So one of the things that I said to Stuart when we were talking about putting this together is that I prepared the first session, but based on what happened at the first session, I was going to create the second session. And based on what happens tonight, we'll create the third session. This is an experiment. We're going through this together. And this has been totally eye-opening for me. And hopefully, it will be for you also. So when I was ruminating about last week's session, and we were talking about gratitude and nature, and there was this fabulous video about gratitude and happiness and all of that. Um, and if you weren't here last week, you can um, give Stuart your email address, and he will email you a copy of last week's handout where you could click on the links. I sat thinking about it, and I realized that it was way too facile to say, well, here's a list of dispositions. We're not cars. What do I mean by that? 
your car's fan bell breaks, you take it into the garage, they go, well, what model car do you have? Well, I have a 2001 Sable Mercury, and they go, oh, you need X fan belt. Put the fan belt in, the fan belt's fixed. Human beings aren't like that. We can't choose a model fan belt. So that if we're talking about dispositions, depending on who you are, you will approach this idea of what your steps are to make it up to Dvei Kut Hashem very, very differently. So I came up in my own mind with three different paradigms of types of dispositions that people might say, this is what I need to, to achieve Dvei Kut Hashem. So what I want to do now is on your handouts, you all have a triangle. Last time I put in the lines. This time I didn't put in lines. Because upon reflection, if I put in lines, I predetermine how many dispositions, how many steps there are. I can't determine that for you. I can only determine that for me. The only one that we agree upon is that the pinnacle of the triangle is the dvekut. So there's only one line there. And inside that small triangle is the dvekut vashem. How do you get there? So I want to just quickly show you three different paradigms I came up with. Open it to the audience to see, are there other ways of thinking about this? And then I want everyone to take a few minutes, figure out if one of these paradigms fits you as a human being. And if so, what order of, of the hierarchy do you need? So if you turn to the page after the one, I have this thing, I always forget the number of pages on the handouts. <laughs> so, you know, I guess I boycott numbers or something. I hate huh. that. So if you turn to the next page, there's paradigm one, and we're only going to give an overview of the paradigms now. Afterwards, we're going to explore them in a little more depth. Paradigm one is for the practical thinker. How do I get to Dvekut Bashem? I need the time. I need the focus. Maybe I need music because it enhances my tefillah. I need to understand what I'm saying. And maybe I need the poetry because when you see a block of print, you get really intimidated, right? When, when I used to teach high school and I would have like a Ramban who has this tendency to go on and on and on, I wouldn't give the kids a block of text. I would break it down because you see a block of text, it's like, forget about it. So that's a paradigm for those of us who are very practically oriented to see how I can make my tefillah meaningful to get to Dvei Kut Vashem. There's a second paradigm at the bottom of the next page, which is the paradigm for, shall I say, the globalists. <laughs> Human beings exist on multiple planes simultaneously. It's just the reality of who we are as human beings. We exist in the physical, in the intellectual, in the psychological, in the emotional, and in the spiritual. So for some of us who may be globalists, we may put together a hierarchy that says, well, first I need something physical, maybe a physical space, maybe to be comfortable. I need to connect to tefillah intellectually. I need to connect psychologically. Maybe that's the paradigm for you. And then there's the third paradigm, which is on the following page, which is a paradigm of characteristics, because for some of us, we don't need the practicalities. We're OK with that. We understand the global nature of the human being, but if I'm not happy, I can't connect to prayer. If I don't feel gratitude, I can't connect to prayer. If I feel no connection, I can't connect to prayer. So those are much more the psycho-emotional um, dispositions towards creating the Dveikut Bashem. So remember, our goal is Dveikut Bashem. Does anybody else have any um, paradigms that are of a totally different nature than the three I've written down here? I just, yeah, I just have a question. Yep. I mean, I, I'm, when I'm thinking about applying this, I mean, are you talking about 
when I'm like sitting down to daven, and this is a paradigm that I apply at that moment while I'm davening, or is this just like sort of a global way of thinking about my life and my orientation so that I sort of have it ready when I come to daven? Beautiful question. The answer is gam vagam. <laughs> because in a certain way, <clears throat> tefillah reflects our lives. Tefillah, in its pure form, should not be, let's see, Mincha's at 7.30, it's over at 7.45, I'm going to do all of this for 15 minutes and then forget it. There should be this penumbra before and after tefillah, so it's a great question. So the answer is yes to both. Okay. It just seems that the last one is the last one is like a more detailed list than the second one, the second paradigm, with the emotional and spiritual aspect is being extended. Uh, yes, but it's for a different kind of person, I think. Because if you're looking at the third paradigm, the physical and the intellectual are less important to you. Um, you know, it's sort of like in the Tochacha, when we get to Nitzavim Vayelech, or even, you know, at the Bahar B'chukotai has a taste of it, where the brachot are like three psukim long, and then you go to the klolot, and it's Arora Tov B'voach, Arora Tov B'tzeicha, Ba'ir, Ba'sadeh, this is going to happen. Why, why are the klolos so much longer than the brachos? Because if you have a bracha, all you have to say is everything should be good by you, and that's all you need. But nobody, God doesn't want to say everything should be bad by you. So this may happen, or that may happen, or that. So it's that kind of thing. If you are a person who focuses on the psycho-emotional, then you would need to break it down much further into happiness, gratitude, connection, belief, dependence, whatever else is in there. That list, by the way, was written in no particular order. I meant to go back and alphabetize it just to say it's in alphabetical order, and I forgot. So it just came up as it came up. Really? I think the last list is the paradigm three is particularly appropriate for someone who doesn't know Hebrew, but is dominating in Hebrew because they might actually be able to have very fulfilling a dominant experience without understanding the word that they're saying. Absolutely. Or they could always use the English side. All right. So let's take a couple of oh, one more? Yeah? So in any of these paradigms, can you incorporate factors from each one into uh, one paradigm? Absolutely. Absolutely. We're all different. Maybe someone says, I need to be physically comfortable, but then I can focus on happiness and gratitude. It's an incredibly personal um, structure. We're all walking our own staircases, and no two people ever in this world walk the same staircase to achieve the dveikut that we're looking for. That's one of the, main, the, the, the amazing things about a Kaddish Baruch Hu. Kaddish Baruch Hu has time and energy for each human being, even though each human being is a totally different relationship that he has with any other human being. OK, so we're now at 22 after. Let's take three to five minutes, do some soul searching, <coughs> some thinking, some writing, because if you're like me, if it's not written down, the next moment it's out of your head, and then we'll go on from there. Um, because they have halachic implications, and I will do nothing with halachic implications of this. That's Keva versus Kavana, and Sibor versus Biyafi. There's a big discussion about saying the words that other people wrote, whether it's Tehillim or the unknown Machaber, whose name has been lost in antiquity, versus talking to Hashem in my own words. But as I said, Keva versus Kavana has distinct halachic implications, as does Davning B'tzibor in a Minyan versus Davning B'yechidut alone. Now, for some people, they find that they can only really uh, get into the zone, to use a sports metaphor, if they're davening b'yechidut. Um, for, you know, some of us in the room, we say, Baruch Shasani Kirtzono in the morning, and it doesn't matter. 
but for other of us, of us, it does. And therefore, that's why I didn't put down B'tzibor versus B'yechidut, because it does have halachic implications, and there are very, very good reasons that it has halachic implications. So nobody's going to ask you to share. I probably should have said that before, so that nobody would be like, oh my god, this is yours. This is your stairway to heaven. If anybody wants to share, call a couple, but nobody is going to ask you. But what I want to do is look a little more deeply into the various uh, paradigms of, of steps that we've been talking about. So, let's look first at paradigm one, time. Time is a real problem. The modern world, we're always running somewhere. Hey, anybody remember when they said that email was going to make our lives simpler? It didn't. Because in addition to everything else that we do now, we're constantly looking at our handheld to check our emails, to just answer that, and then uh, you're checking your faxes, you're downloading your attachments, you're checking the voicemail on your cell phone and your home phone and your office phone, and life is just faster and faster and faster. How do we get the time that we need? Whether it means time to come to shul or just time to focus on tefillah. That is a really good question. I remember years ago, I've always been really busy. You know, holding down a job, two jobs, raising kids, whatever. And I remember when I had three little kids running around in a full-time job, my mother calls me one day and she says, Sharon, I want you to sign up for tennis lessons. <laughs> I said, what? I don't want to play tennis. And she goes, no, I really want you to sign up for tennis lessons. I said, why? She said, because then you will have an hour a week where you know you have to have a tennis lesson. You're not going to take those tennis lessons, so you will just have found an hour in the week for yourself. <laughs> it's actually brilliant. I mean, I didn't sign up for the tennis lessons. But we make time for our friends. We make time for our spouses. We make time for our kids. We make time for our boss. We make time, this will be a great segue, into volunteering for the shul, right? Coming to shul elections. We make time for all of that a little self-care. We need to carve out time for ourselves. We all have our electronic <laughs> calendars. So how crazy would it be if I log on to my calendar and I put in an hour a week that says my thinking time. And then it's there. And then it pops up on your phone and it tells you that in 15 minutes is your time for you. Now, when I say self-care, you know, a lot of people do self-care, go have a mani-pedi or whatever. That's good self-care, too. But that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about tefillah self-care, tvekut self-care. Plug it into your calendar. Sign up for your figurative tennis lessons and then cancel them. Focus. Um, some people are visual. The way they focus is they're looking at something. Mm -hmm. If someone's visual, then look at the tefillot in the sidur, because you can focus on what you're seeing. Some people are more audio oriented. Close your eyes if you're in shul. Let the tefillah wash over you, and it can but you need to focus on what you're listening to. Now, so much of the stimuli goes in, in through our eyes that if we really are oral in nature, it's much better to close your eyes because you're not going to get distracted by this one walking around and what's she wearing and, you know, who got that aliyah. Let the sound wash over you. Some people are kinesthetic. Now, there's this meme going around the, the web about the different shucklers. Has anybody seen that? Yeah. It's hysterical. Yeah. Um, I wasn't going to play it here because I thought it was a little offensive <laughs> to some of the shucklers. But why do people shuckle? 
because some people focus better when they're moving, especially if your eyes are closed. There's a really good physiological reason that people shuckle and that they shuckle the way they shuckle. So go search for the meme on the web. You'll probably get a, a good laugh out of it. But that's because they can focus because they are kinesthetic in, in nature. So we need to figure out who we are in order to create our own focus. Um, music. I mentioned this last week also. Um, until Thursday, we don't play music. It's the middle of Sphera. Um, but the music makes a difference too. The music if we are in shul makes a difference. The music in our own heads makes a difference. If you're davening v'yechidut, there's no reason you shouldn't be davening out loud with the music. The music, music is a universal language. To me, what is the language of music? It's the language of emotion. You feel something when the tune changes, and that creates this dvekut also in and of itself. Understanding. People who speak Hebrew are very fortunate. You know, the school children growing up in Eretz Yisrael have it all over American school children. Am I right, Rini? Because they get it. When they say, Modeh ani lefanecha melechai v'kayam, you don't have to start explaining to them, Modeh means thank you, and if you're a girl, it's Modeh ani is me, and lefanecha before, they get it. Because we're in Galut, we don't really get it. You don't really get it? Look at the English side. Nothing wrong with that. And the truth is, because so much of our tefillah is from Tehillim or from really, really old sources, some of those words are pretty arcane. Nothing wrong. It's not cheating to look at the English side when you're focusing on what you're saying and say, what is it that I'm saying to Hashem here? We need to understand what it is we're saying. And the last one in this is poetry. Now this is the easiest to miss in tefillah. No tefillah is prose. It may look like prose because it's clumped together in paragraphs in the sitter, but it's not. So what I did was, um, the only sidor I know that really does it anywhere near this is the Corin Sachs sidor. This is my own, um, we created a, a Sidor in school for, for uh, our children, and this is how I set it up for them. Because again, children looking at a block of text, forget about it. But look at the poetry here. This is uh, the, the section between the end of, we were just talking about dedicating ourselves to shul time. Oh, President Shimoff, do you need us? I do. I need a quorum. You guys look like a quorum. <laughs> Do you want to bring everybody else in here? We'll stop for a minute. We'll bring them up right for a We'll have a two minute election and then we'll continue. Talk about Walter's <laughs> stairway to heaven. <laughs> okay. Okay, we're so back. So, this is the section between um, the Shema and the Amidah. So, the first thing we have is Hashem Elokechem Emet. But look at the poetry. There are 15 uh, words after that. It's not <coughs> coincidental. V'yatsi, v'nachon, v'kayam, v'yashar, v'ne'eman, v'ahu, v'chavi, v'nachma, v'na'im, v'na'ra, v'adir, umtukan, umkubal, v'tov, v'yafet. What is 15? Yud and a He. 15 is the name of God. We're describing the essence of God. And what is the first and overarching characteristic of God? It's the word that precedes those 15, emet. And we keep repeating it. Adavar hazel leolam va'ed. Emet elokei olam malkeinu. Scroll down. Al harishonim v'al ha'achronim davar tov v'kayam leolam va'ed. Emet ve'emunah chok lo yavor. Scroll down. Emet atahu adom amecha melech gibar lariv rivam. Emet atahu rishon v'atahu acharon. Over and over again, the poetry is saying, 
truth. God is truth. That's how we step into the Amidah. This is brilliant poetry. The other thing it does is it gives you a mantra. Anybody ever really not focus on, on what you're doing and you're sort of mumbling the stuff and you get to a mat and you stop and you go, which a mat was I on? A mat Adonhu or a mat who Rishon? It's a mantra, but it can trip you up. It forces you to focus. So, in these words of Amet, we have the poetry that God is truth preceding the 15 adjectives. We have a mantra that we keep repeating, and we have a reason that we must be focusing on what we're saying, or else, you know, you can get into this never ending loop of Amet Atau Adom Amachamach, Gibola Rivibom Amet, Amet Atau Adom Amachamach, yeah, you could be here all day. You really need to focus on what you're doing. This is amazing stuff, Rini. Really? What I would like to say is also a song that has a sort of music without having a musical tune to it. That is, it, there's a music to the words without having a mamash mangina to it right. that also is describing the attributes or essence of the country. Absolutely. That's the, the, the rhythm, the beat. Um, uh, why am I blanking on it? Kiviti Hashem. Yeah, and then you, you repeat it. I mean, Halel Hagadol, Kili Olam Chazel, right? Hodu Lashem Kitov Kili Olam Chazel. Hodu La Elokei Halokim Kili Olam Chazel. Kili Olam Chazel. That's, yeah, the poetry is incredible. And if we can connect to the poetry, it should inspire us. That's the point of poetry versus prose, is the inspiring element. So that's paradigm one. Paradigm two, the globalists. It's at the bottom. It's right under the, the end of the section of Emet. Mm -hmm. The physical. Now, the physical may mean that we need to be settled. Or it may mean the environment makes a difference. Anybody ever, I don't know, dabbing on a mountaintop at sunset and all of a sudden you feel one with the world? That's the physical. It's because of the environment you've put yourself in. It's probably one of the reasons that the Shulchan Aruch has so many halachot about you're not allowed to daven in a place that's dirty. You're not allowed to daven in a place that has refuse in it. Because the environment makes a difference. How we are physically feeling makes a difference. How we are um, in space makes a difference. There's a reason the Amidah is the Amidah, the standing prayer. There is a reason that we are bowing. There is a reason that we are getting down on our knees still on Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur. Because the physical does make a difference. Um, the intellectual. Some people can't connect to the tefillah unless they cognitively understand. What is it saying? Where does it come from? Why is it in the siddur? I mean, some of those things are hard to answer. Uh, one of my favorites is Yukum Khan that we're still davening for the Reshe Galuta, you know, for the, the head of the community in Bavel. It is what it is, but some people feel like unless they can connect to this intellectually, they're just not going to get it. Then comes the psychological. Now, the psychological means we need to be open to ideas, and the emotional means we need to be open to feelings. And the spiritual means we need to let go and just experience. You cannot be at one with the world when you are holding on to, to too much. You need to let go and just be in the experience. And if anybody has ever done that, you, you know what I mean. It's sort of like the kind of thing where, lo aleinu, if someone is sitting shiva, you're not allowed to learn Torah. Because for people who love learning Torah, you lose yourself in the experience of learning Torah. That's when Lima Torah becomes a spiritual exercise and no longer an intellectual exercise. You forget about time, you forget where you are, you forget anybody who's around you. And at Shiva, of course, we always need to be in touch with our grief. That's, that's the point of, of Shiva. Uh, and so that's, that's why the Esur, but it's a good example of losing ourselves.
Okay. So we are going to look at an example of this paradigm, which I think is just a really interesting thing. So what is empathy, and why is it very different than sympathy? Empathy fuels connection. Sympathy drives disconnection. Empathy, it's a, it, very interesting. Teresa Wiseman is a nursing scholar who studied professions, very diverse professions, where empathy is relevant and came up with four qualities of empathy. Perspective taking, the ability to take the perspective of another person or, or recognize their perspective as their truth. Staying out of judgment, not easy when you enjoy it as much as most of us do. <laughs> Recognizing emotion in other people and then communicating that. Empathy is feeling with people. And to me, I always think of empathy as this kind of sacred space where someone's kind of in a deep hole and they shout out from the bottom and they say, I'm stuck, it's dark, I'm overwhelmed. And then we look and we say, hey, you climb down. I know what it's like down here. And you're not alone. Sympathy is, ooh, it's bad, uh-huh. Uh, no, you want a sandwich? Empathy is a choice, and it's a vulnerable choice, because in order to connect with you, I have to connect with something in myself that knows that feeling. Rarely, if ever, does an empathic response begin with at least. <laughs> I had a, yeah. And we do it all the time. Because you know what? Someone just shared something with us that's incredibly painful, and we're trying to silver lining it. I don't think that's a verb, but I'm using it as one. We're trying to put the silver lining around it. So, I had a miscarriage. Oh, at least you know you can get pregnant. I think my marriage is falling apart. At least you have a marriage. <laughs> John's getting kicked out of school. At least Sarah is an A student. <laughs> One of the things we do sometimes in the face of very difficult conversations is we try to make things better. If I share something with you that's very difficult, I'd rather you say, I don't even know what to say right now, I'm just so glad you told me. Because the truth is, rarely can a response make something better. What makes something better is connection. So what I want to ask you is, which of the dispositions in paradigm two, physical, intellectual, psychological, emotional, spiritual, was that video addressing? Spiritual? Emotional? Psychological? Physical? And intellectual. She was intellectualizing the difference between empathy and sympathy. Now, there's a reason that I'm going down this road, because life is messy. I've created these nice little steps as if they're all self-contained. And what I want to acknowledge is they're not all self-contained. They're all messed up with each other. And what we need to do to get this to Dvekut is to see how we can separate out the strands. So, what time is it? Ten off. Sharon? Yep. Why do we have to separate them? Why can't we use them as building blocks on top of each other? Really good question. Some of us can. Some of us can deal with messes and life is messy. So once again, it's a very personal thing. Some people handle lots of stuff at the same time and just keep moving forward. And some people say, too much. I've got to retreat. I can't do this. So it's really a, a very, very personal, personal thing. I was going to say something about life being messy. Um, oh, I remember what I was going to say. Um, I was at a conference a few years ago, and this woman, it was for um, uh, educational administrators. And this woman was talking about, and most of us are, are women, 
about how we're all constantly juggling, right? We all know the paradigm of we're juggling balls and we're always afraid we're going to drop one. And invariably, we're all going to drop one. But this is what I loved about what she said. She said, doesn't matter if you drop one, just make sure the one you drop is rubber so it bounces back to you and not crystal so that it shatters. Brilliant, right? We're always worried about dropping the ball. Don't worry about dropping the ball, just make sure what you drop is a rubber one. For some people, this allegory is great and others go, I, I can't juggle more than two balls. But you're right, for some people it doesn't make a difference. So for those of you who looked at paradigm three, this is much longer because these, this is for people who really need to get baomek deeply into what they're feeling and what they need to feel and what they need to accomplish before they can feel this Dveikut Bashem. And I'm always going to go back to it. That's the why. The why is Dveikut Bashem. So we're going to look at one more video, which is really uh, an amazing video, because that's the only kind of juice. <laughs> And I'm going to ask you afterwards why you think I chose this video to show, given what the framework of this session is all about. in Italian with subtitles. Wow. 
They were the youngest son. He two days, two days ago turned three. He was sitting with me at the park when a sparrow sat in front of us. My son asked me 24 <laughs> times what it was, <laughs> and I answered all 21 times that it was a sparrow. I hugged him every single time he asked me the same question, again and again, without getting mad, feeling affection for my innocent little boy. loves us every time answers the same questions over and over again. The connection. The connection. The dveikut. That's what dveikut Bashem is all about. It doesn't matter how many times we ask, God will answer us and put his arm around us every single time. So the question, the work that we're going to do together next time, is to take this hierarchy that each one of us has created personally and see where in the Siddur we can connect emotionally, spiritually, physically, and do the work together to see how each of us can climb our own stairway to the Dvekut that we're all looking for. Thank you. Thank you.